This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome back again to our virtual worship at Christ Lutheran Church in Cary, Ohio. Uh, welcome back. Glad to have you here with us. Today is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and uh, it is going to uh, be coming very soon in not just too many weeks that we draw this year to a close and start the new year off in the end of November. And uh, so without further ado, let us begin. We begin with the confession and forgiveness, the confession of our sins in the forgiveness, the promise we receive from God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Let us confess our sins before God and even among one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors, and we keep your gift of salvation to others. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends, God hears the cries of those who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to share with you the words of praise oftentimes following the confession and forgiveness, we usually have our opening hymn, and, uh, and then we go through the liturgies. But uh, this week in particular, I wanted you to hear these words of, of, of praise that come from a very popular hymn, one you probably know, Beautiful Savior. This is the last verse of that hymn, spoken as if the poetry comes to life. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise and adoration, now and forevermore be thine. And the Lord be with you. Let us join our hearts together in the prayer of the day. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This morning we have our usual three texts before us. The first one, the first reading, is from the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah is speaking, but he is speaking on the behalf of God. O Lord, you are my God, the prophet declares. I will exalt you, I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. 
it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the no noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of your clouds. The song of the ruthless was still. And on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast, cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. And he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading continues in the book of Thessalonians, or I'm sorry, in the book of Philippians. Next week, we'll be moving into Thessalonians. But for this week, we conclude these, these four weeks of readings from Philippians as the Apostle writes these words in the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Sintishi to be of the same mind in the Lord, Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, to help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be, be known to everyone. For the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, my beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we turn our attention to the gospel reading. And I want you to know this is another in a rather lengthy series of parables that Jesus is telling. And to put this into context, I want you to remember that the triumphal entry into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday celebration has already happened. And Jesus is now continuously being confronted by the leaders of the church. And so in this reading from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, we have yet another parable. 
And so this is the Holy Gospel for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and they went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. So those slaves went out into the streets and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. That's a tough one to follow. This is one of those, one, one parable in particular, uh, one Bible story that I don't imagine there's going to be too many people reading to their children at bedtime. It's intended for a theologically mature audience only, if you will. In fact, without that that proper attention to the context of Jesus' time, that's why I shared what I did. I'm not sure that this particular part of the parable is conducive to Christian uh, preaching at all. Now, that sounds pretty tough, but let me give you a little more, more contemporary background. You see, when I first started out in this work, um, 30 years ago now, at that time, you had an option of ending at verse 10. I'll be honest with you, I took advantage of that. I ended the gospel reading at verse 10. Prior to that, for that matter, the verses 11 through 14 were not even an option. Apparently, over the course of time, people began to realize that there's an awful lot going on in this parable. As some people would say it, these two parables, the first of that wedding feast ending at verse 10, the slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is the gospel of the Lord. And that is the first part, the first parable, if you will. But for better or for worse, Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues on. Now, let's go back into the, the context, if you will, of Jesus' time and place. 
when Matthew inscribed his accounting of this event that took place in Jerusalem during what we now call Holy Week. It comes across as a difficult text because it is all about judgment. You see, in all of these readings that we've been enjoying this summer, and I choose that word carefully, some have been a little bit tough to take, but yet by the same token, it has been an entire series. It's almost as if it's a, a, a section of a catalog for short stories as Jesus tells all these, these different things. And actually, you have to go clear back to June to recall the event known as Peter's Confession. Maybe you still remember it, maybe not, but let me refresh your memory. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Who do people say that I am? And then Jesus looks and lovingly says, but you, who do you say I am? And it was then that Peter spoke up and he says, well, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you to Peter and to all the disciples and all who would follow after them. Jesus says, blessed are you. Whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, that was the binding and loosening. Now Jesus went on from there telling more of these short stories, if you will, about how the church is supposed to respond to, you know, to pointing out you know, the, the right behavior, the wrong behavior, all of those sorts of things. But that isn't the point of the text. Judgment is very much a part of it, but we need to get beyond our human terms so that we can listen closely to what God is telling us through his son during this holiest of weeks. Because by the end of the week, we are going to have a trial. We're going to have a crucifixion. And then we're going to have the glorious power of the resurrection. But between the, the, the binding and the loosening, the crucifixion and the resurrection, there stands in the middle judgment. We don't like to think about that too often. I know I don't. I work each day as if to be around for the next 50 years. The math is against me. But I prepare each day as if I were going to be gone tomorrow. You see, I am confident that by the power of, God, of Christ's resurrection, my future is secured. And yet in the meantime, I strive to live my life according to the glorious calling. That one of which, you know, the Apostle Paul is in, encouraging the Philippians to live by. But in between those things, there comes yet some other things. This is the third consecutive week of addressing directly the chief priests and the elders of the church. All of these have overtones of judgment. All are after Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And so today's parable, especially the second story, the second part of the story is a pinnacle moment. Now, not a peak like a mountain where it's all downhill from here, but it is a focal point. It is a point toward which we endeavor to travel. 
so that when that day of judgment comes, we can hear the grace of God opened for us for all of eternity. But somewhere between the binding and the loosening, the crucifixion and the resurrection, judgment nevertheless must enter in. And that's the challenge for you and for me. It is the invitation. It is, it is, it is the, 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 the king in the, in the first parable, God, if you will, who sends his servants out to invite everyone. Go, he finally commands, having found others to be unworthy, says go and find everyone. And if the gospel lesson ended at verse 10, that would be fine. But it doesn't. Because unfortunately, that judgment is an important aspect of our Christian life as well. We are saints and we are sinners. There are those moments that we do things and we do things very well. And you can almost hear Jesus speaking, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your father's house. Then there are those other moments. Kind of like Peter. Do you remember back in June when Peter made this confession of his faith and receives blessing from Jesus? It was the very following Sunday. That, that Jesus likened Peter to Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter had his attention turned from the ways of God into the ways of the world. And it was at that point that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you are concerned about earthly things, not what my Father has prepared for you. That's judgment. Sometimes you and I get, get roped into the worries of this world. And boy, isn't that something going on in our world today, the present context. It's a tough time. It truly is. And yet, God, who is full of mercy and love and grace will lead us and guide us through. How that's going to take shape, dear friends, God only knows. But we wait and live in hope. But we also need to come to this second part. We need to come to this second parable, this second part of the story, the part that that sometimes we wish wasn't there. But it is still God who speaks. Jesus who makes his Father known so that we have a future of hope. When the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. See, this is when the, the, the focus shifts toward the judgment. Those chief priests and the elders, time and again, would cast judgment on themselves. That's what this part is representing. That is the, those who have not yet begun to see the glory of, of the light of God in Christ Jesus. The unity that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. That calling from Christ to face up to and deal with the reality of the world in which we live. In short, what that man who was left speechless failed to realize is that he lacked 
the robe of God's righteousness. Clothed in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You and I risk falling in, in, into that same trap sometimes when we let the worries of this world overcome us. Judgment comes to you, just as it does to me. But the judgment that comes upon you and me is not in our refusal of Christ's invitation, for that in and of itself is the judgment. But it's when we struggle to believe that promise and that hope to be true. One of my favorite authors is Father Robert Capon. You can uh, find his books, uh, you know, Google them, whatever you want to do. But you can find his books online. Um, a, a couple of them, one in particular that is still near and dear to my heart is, is his little, thin little book called The Third Peacock. I recommend that. But this is actually a quote from one of his other uh, books. This is Father uh, uh, Robert Capon, Party Spirit, Some Entertaining Principles. And it is a powerful, powerful story, but I want to quote part of this as it speaks to invitations, as it speaks to not so much our refusal of the invitation, but it's hearing that promise given as the invitation. Capon writes, It may well be that the occasional invitation you issue or accept to nosh, to dine, or to splash in someone's pool is the only remaining sacrament in your life of the way the future really works. To begin with, it is a call home. It is a summons to belong based not on your fitness, which is iffy at best, but on someone else's willingness to say that all unfitness to one side, he knows where he wants you to be. It comes from behind you, out of an unseeable tomorrow, about which there is nothing for you to say except yes or no. And third, it can be enjoyed in, in only one way, by saying yes and walking, first and foremost, indulging yourself in the acceptance offered. Your invitation is your judgment the judgment that you are worthy, are worthy. With those first ones invited or without them, the king's party came off. In the end, the wedding was furnished with guests brought in from the highways and the hedges. As Matthew reports, the good and the bad, all of them, the only subsequent trouble with the, with the character who was tossed out for not putting on the free wedding garment only proves the sovereignty of the call. Once the king has proclaimed his higher order in which everyone is acceptable, there is no workable response except yes. And then... This is where Capon really shines. It is not that judgment comes as a result of a refusal. The invitation itself is the judgment. You're okay, Charlie. If you insist you're not, go gnash your teeth somewhere else. Did you get that? You see, the invitation has been given you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the shepherd of the sheep. We are those sheep. We are those ones called, gathered, enlightened, and made holy, not because of our acts, but because of what God in Christ has done, even as he invites us into that. The invitation is the judgment. You're okay. You're okay. Come to the banquet. Come, enjoy, and feast. And let my peace, my love, my mercy shine forth through this day, through this year, through your lifetime, and even into all eternity. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. <clears throat> With the whole church in heaven and on earth, we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, dear friends, we turn our attention to the prayers, asking God for his presence in our lives, in the lives of others. For with confidence in God's grace and mercy, we pray for the church, for the world, and for all of those who are in need. Lord of the church, when conflicts threaten within your body, Lead us to seek and live the mind of Christ and to be known for our gentleness despite our differences. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You rejoice in your good creation. Provide, provide moisture for parched places, wind and sun for flooded lands, and shelter and sustenance for creatures of every kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And faithful one, let your world rejoice in peace, that peace which surpasses understanding, at tables overflowing with good food and drink, and where shrouds of sorrow are lifted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God of steadfast love, let your people rejoice with faces wiped free of tears, minds unbound from disgrace, bodies freed from suffering, and souls restored. Especially, we pray for those whom we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come near us, Lord God. Let your faithful rejoice in every assembly, in praise and singing, word and deed, unrestrained from worry and unchained from fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we thank you for those faithful people who have taken their places at your eternal banquet. Keep us joyful in the confidence that we too will at last dwell in your eternal, everlasting presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, 
and enfold us in your loving arms, all for whom we pray, trusting in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear friends, thank you for joining us. Let me leave you with this blessing. May Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Hope to see you back here again next week. I hope you have a great week ahead of you. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.